Okay, welcome back everyone. Uh, we can go to the next slide. We will now be moving into our next panel, ensuring accurate reporting in HUD systems. Turn my video on. There we go. This session will be moderated by Adrian Datcher, Director of Coordination and Compliance in PIH's Office of Field Operations. Adrienne is an accomplished housing professional with more than 30 years of experience in the industry. She has worked in both HUD headquarters and the Greensboro field office and is passionate about ensuring the needs of both are, are considered and met. She currently leads a team of 14 diverse professionals where her motto is collaboration and communication are key to success. Adrienne is a 2020 HUD Secretary Award recipient and a graduate of HUD's Emerging Leaders Program. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in English from North Carolina University, uh, sorry, North Carolina Central University, and a Master's of Science in Computer Information Systems from the University of Phoenix. Adrienne is an avid reader who spends her spare time building her personal library. Also joining us is Jeff Zimmerman, a program an analyst in the Office of Housing Voucher Programs Program Support Division. Prior to joining HUD in 2020, Jeff worked at several public housing authorities and for Nan McKay for over 10 years. He held several director and management roles varying from the HCD program, public housing, capital fund, procurement, and IT. Jeff joined the HUD Chicago field office in 2020 as a portfolio management specialist and then moved over to the Office of Housing Voucher Program as a program analyst in 2023. His main responsibilities are the EVMS project, various public and internal dashboards, including the PIC error and VMS dashboards, and the emergency housing voucher program. Uh, after Jeff's presentation, he will be joined by Marika Bertram to help answer questions. Marika, who is joining us from the great state of Hawaii, uh, where it is very early and we're so grateful that she's here, um, is the Division Director of Data Management in HUD's Office of Housing Voucher Programs Program Support Division. Marika has worked at HUD for over 14 years and has worked in both HUD's HCV program and the Office of Field Policy and Management. She currently focuses on developing data visualizations for the HCV dashboard, emergency housing voucher dashboard, and the special purpose voucher dashboard, as well as working on process improvements uh, for the administration of the voucher programs. She has a master's degree in public policy from Georgetown University and a Bachelor of Arts in Economic and Urban History from Columbia University. She is a graduate of the Excellence in Government program and a former Presidential Management Fellow. She is also the loving mother of three adorable kids and ex excited to be home in Hawaii and have her family grow up in the Aloha State. Uh, we will also be joined by Denise Rock, Program Analyst at HUD's Financial Management Center. Denise has worked for HUD for 33 years, where she began her career as a co cooperative education student in the Office of Public Housing. She currently serves as the administrator of the Voucher Management System, or VMS. Additionally, she is working on a VMS validation team to develop standard operating procedures to provide process and, and program improvement. Denise also serves as the, the, audit liaison, uh, I'm sorry, the audit liaison for the FMC. She has two master's degrees from the University of Missouri, one in organizational behavior and one in human resources. She has a bachelor's degree in business from the same university. Denise is the mother of two and currently lives in Kansas City with her husband of 32 years and her rescue pit bull. She is an advocate for volunteerism and currently sits on the board of two nonprofits, the March of Dimes and the Great Plains ASPCA. And then finally, we will hear from Wendelin Havendegg. Deputy House, uh, Housing Information Portal, or HIP, Program Manager in the Real Estate Management Center. Wendelin gradu graduated with honors from the University of Nebraska at Omaha with a degree in elementary education. She started with HUD in 2002 as a program analyst in PIH's Omaha field office and worked there until 20, uh, June 2015. Before moving into her current position in REAC, she worked in PIH headquarters in the Office of Field Operations and the Moving to Work Office. Wendelin is a subject matter expert for IMS PIC and has worked with several other PIH systems. She has been the HUD 50058 product owner for both the PIC and G Housing Information Portal project since 2017 and the MTW supplement model uh, module from 2020 to 2023. 
She is the deputy HIP program manager in addition to her product owner duties. In her spare time, she likes to be outdoors with her guide dog, listening to music, doing genealogy research, writing, and relaxing. So Adrian, we will pass it over to you. Okay, thank you, Andrea, so much. Good morning, everyone. I'm not sure if you can turn my video on because I can't, but at any rate, I will get started. Okay, there's my prompt. All right, still not working for me, but I'm going to continue. So in our previous panels, okay, great. So in our previous panels, we focused on the program aspects of our special purpose voucher portfolio. We talked about the importance of making connections, uh, collaborating with partners and commitment to the goal of housing more families. In our last panel, Regional Director LaShore introduced the concept of consistency, which aligns with our discussion for this panel. Here we will discuss the importance of consistent, accurate data reporting in HUD systems. Mr. Jeff Zimmerman will provide a demo of the PIC era dashboard and the voucher management system or VMS. Um, after which, Ms. Wendelin Hovindick will discuss the upcoming transition to the housing information portal or HIP. And you will see why it is vitally important to correct errors and ensure data accuracy as we prepare for this transition. So we'll split the session in two. Um, after Jeff's demo, we'll take questions related to that, and then we'll turn it over to Wendelin and have her uh, talk about the HIP transition, and then we'll take questions from, uh, for her session. As always, please uh, place any questions that you have during the session into the chat, and we will answer them as we can. And without further ado, I will turn it over to you, Jeff. Awesome. Thanks so much, Adrian. Hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me uh, here to talk about the Pick Error Dashboard. So we uh, will definitely focus on the SPVs. I know that's obviously the whole point of the conference, but uh, the good part about this dashboard is it really addresses Pick as a whole. Um, and obviously, everyone knows how important PIC is, right? And especially when it comes to SPVs, and especially as we transition to HIP and EVMS in the future, uh, those 5.8 Data reporting is just super important. Um, obviously, your system of records are great. You guys can use them on a daily basis. But here at HUD, we really lean on uh, IMS PICA right now and then eventually HIP. So, um, so we did create the PICA dashboard as a public-facing dashboard, which is important to note because there is no PII on it. Um, I will absolutely share my screen shortly here, and we'll jump into it. But um, since it's public-facing, like I said, there's no PII. The main thing here for the PIC error dashboard is it's not meant to replace PIC. PIC is super important. So as you do your weekly or biweekly or monthly, however often your PHA submits their 5.8s, it's critical to still go into PIC and view those errors. Um, I know some of the PHA softwares out there do a great job of transmitting those 5.8s to PIC pretty seamlessly for you. However, sometimes those... Um, acceptance messages can be a little confusing. Just because a 5.8 has been sent to PIC does not mean it was accepted. So it's still super important to check PIC, go in there and see if anything was actually balanced or if it was successfully submitted. So here in this slide, thank you so much. Um, I have included a bunch of blue links that you probably can't click right now, but you will once this is all shared. Um, these are just general resources. We will go through them on the demo as well uh, for PIC, the dashboard, and for also for VMS. Um, most of them are the, the common tools, the job aids, et cetera. Uh, but I always like to share these during presentations like this because we really do view this dashboard as a tool, not as like the actual system, right? So it's important to still have all of the supporting documents and materials uh, ready for you. Uh, so without further ado, if I may, I will start to share my screen. Second, it should. Okay. Oh, there's that lovely doc. Let me just that over here. Excellent. Okay. So I'm hoping everyone can see my screen. Adrian, give me a, a shake if not, but um, we should be at the Pick Our Dashboard website. So uh, we'll definitely include the link in the chat and then also in the presentation. However, um, I tend to frankly just Google the Pick Error Dashboard. Uh, main reason why is because uh, one of the top links is obviously this, but it's also all of our resources on HUD Exchange. Um, but when you get to the main website, 
there's a couple of things I want to look over before we dive into the dashboard. Um, the first thing is this, the first two blue links, super important. Obviously, these dashboards are here. Obviously, they are way too small to view unless you're looking on a projector. Um, you are able to maximize it by clicking the fit to page button in the bottom right. However, when you click these two blue links, separate tabs will open up. So that way is full screen, which I was kind of uh, basically automatically do right away. Below the dashboards are a whole bunch of resources. So we'll go into how errors get removed in a little bit. However, I do want to highlight uh, this Excel template. So when you download this, uh, I will be referring to this later, but this is how you can remove uh, bulk errors that don't come off automatically. So this link is super important. I always have to highlight it. From there, as we go lower, it's mainly just training materials and resources. Uh, the training links will always bring you to the HUD exchange sites that we'll go to in a second. And below, we like to call them one pagers, even though most of them are at least two pages, if not three. Um, but we've tried to identify the most common 5.8 errors that have been popping up um, in the dashboards and also in all the PHAs that we've been working with to try to help clean up their 5.8 data. Um, and so we tried to create little either videos or uh, short job aids that will go over the common causes and also some of the common solutions. Jeff, is it possible mm -hmm. to zoom in your screen just a little bit? Absolutely. Thank Perfect. you for telling me. Thank you so much. Yeah, of course. And then below some of the common job aids um, is another uh, training link that we'll see in a second. And then lastly, and arguably most importantly, uh, the local pit coach listing. So all the field offices have awesome resources known as pit coaches. They are the first line of defense when it comes to 5-8 issues and submitting them and getting them accepted into PIC. Um, they're great to work with. So at the very bottom of our page, we always include a link here. So that way you can see an updated uh, listing of who's the pit coach in what field office. So now we'll just pretend that we click one of the training materials and we'll hop on over to HUD Exchange. So we have the trainings broken down into a couple different categories, um, as you can see. The biggest one that we always like to point out to PHAs, especially when it comes to showing their staff, are the introduction videos. Um, this is a much longer version, much more in-depth version than what we'll be doing here in the panel, um, but it really goes through the ins and the outs and the specifics of how to use it and also showing how it cor um, correlates with PIC. Job bays we already talked about, a whole list of them can be here. And then this is a more intricate of, okay, we're looking at the dashboard. I need a quick and dirty. How do I do this without having to watch a long video? This guide will be the tool for you. YouTube has a lot of our pre-recorded webinars. Uh, so not just the intro training, but webinars similar to this. Um, so you can always find that here. And then no matter when you are in the HUD exchange, um, call it the error dashboard umbrella on the right-hand side, you'll always be able to get to the additional uh, resources that we mentioned. Lastly, and certainly not least, uh, the pick or job aids. Uh, I believe actually one of the main people who created this is actually on these calls. And I know back in my PHA days, this page was bookmarked and I used it regularly. Uh, it is very detailed procedures, walkthroughs, how to solve certain errors, and it's broken down by section of IMS pick. Um, they are amazing resources and when my previous role as a pit coach for the Chicago field office, this was something I would send out to all of my PHAs all the time. Um, new staff, existing staff, these are just awesome resources that I would highly recommend everyone bookmark um, and re reference frequently. Most of the questions, especially the common questions, really can be solved by looking in here. Okay, so back to the dashboards. So what are the dashboards? What do they do? Why are they important? So again, this is just a tool, right? It's not meant to replace PIC. You can't actually solve the errors from within the dashboard. This dashboard is only showing you the errors that are in PIC. Um, one of the most important things I always like to start off with is the date in the top right corner. Uh, usually in the past, this dashboard updated every Monday. Currently, a lot of the backend jobs uh, for PIC and some of the data extracts that we rely on have been intermittently failing. Um, our IT folks at HUD have been actively working on that, so we're trying to get it resolved. Um, so some of the dates will reflect that. So hence, it's June 5th, and we're looking at data as of May 20th. Um, but either way, this first dashboard, it shows you all of the pH, all of your errors that are uh, open or outstanding for your PHA. And at the top, you can go through all the different filters. So usually I start with the state because if you don't go with the state, the PHA code list is extremely long, right? Because it's all the PHAs. Um, I did decide to pick on my home state uh, today. So we will be seeing Connecticut in general uh, for these next couple dashboards. 
So the first one is pretty uh, cut and dry, right? It just lists out all of the errors by a certain PHI. So actually we will also use the first PHI I ever worked out. Uh, if anyone's here from Bridgeport, hello. Um, but what it will do is it will show you a couple of stats. So at the top right corner, we'll always see, actually, just in case, there we go. Uh, it'll always show the pick rejections and also the form. So what's the difference? So um, multiple 5.8s can be on one pick submission form. So that's why these numbers are different. So in this case, you know, obviously one form that was submitted to pick has multiple errors on it. That's the only reason why there's a difference there. But the filters will also let you break it down by HCV or public housing. Uh, so depending on, you know, what aspect or what uh, side of the fence you're on at your PHA, you'll be able to view that. And then down below is the actual errors. So starting from the left to the right, uh, the pick ticket number, obviously probably the most one of the most important. Once you are in pick, you can use this to search it and it'll automatically find that ticket for you. Um, obviously going back and looking through old tickets manually is a brutal task. So we try to make that a little bit easier here. The unique ID is something that we generate internally. Uh, since this is public facing, we are not able to include a lot of PII data, whether it's names, birth dates, obviously social security numbers, right? So um, we understand it's tricky to identify who these people are, which is why we also included the form number. So the form number will tell you which 58 on that ticket number we're talking about, whether it's the Smith family, the Jones family, et cetera. The form number will be able to tell you that. And then also we like to break down the action type. What type of 58 is it? Um, I'll talk a little bit about analyzing train, potential training needs a bit, but that's one of the tools here. Lastly, we'll always show if it's an SPV. That way, if there's something you really want to trick, uh, you know, focus on, or if staff are only focused on certain things, like for example, FSS, um, et cetera, it's just easier to kind of break it down by that. And then here's a description of the actual error, what actually went wrong. All of these columns can be sorted. Uh, so you can do it by the error type, you could do it by the effective date, if you want to see what's really old, et cetera. Um, most 5.8 errors do fall off automatically. Um, so if it's like, uh, I don't know, there's so many that do that will come off. So once a corrected 5.8 or a different 5.8 is submitted, it uses the head of household social security number to match the two, right? So the head of household social on the fatal, head of household on the corrected 5.8, that's how we link it. There are obviously also many situations where errors will not come off. Uh, it can be a social security number problem. Uh, those are probably the most common, or if it's like um, you try to submit a port out, but pick auto generated it, those won't come off automatically. That's where that Excel file comes into handy. So from here, you have two different options to remove, we like to call manually remove errors. The first one here, this blue link will open up form. I would use the form if you have like one, two or three errors you want to remove. It's pretty basic. It will just ask for the needed materials, materials, sorry, the needed information that we need to remove the error. And then if you have a lot of errors, let's say uh, an entire 5.8 ticket was resubmitted to pick by accident. If you have 50 fatal errors that need to come off, obviously I'm not going to make you do 50 forms. Um, so if you fill out, download and fill out this Excel template with all the information and send it to your local pick coach, they'll know who to route it to and we can get those all removed for you. So moving on to the next dashboard. The monitoring dashboards in general, uh, you'll see two of them. They're mainly used, um, I would say primarily here at HUD in the field offices in case they want to take a look at the big picture, but it might not be a bad thing either uh, for certain PHAs to see you know, how you're doing compared to other areas, other areas in the country, whether it's other PHAs in your state, et cetera. Uh, maybe you can find a PHA near you that's doing really well and you can work with them, et cetera. From there, moving on. So this is the common one. So this is the ones I always really like that I wish I had when I was at a PHA because it breaks it down uh, by the 5A type and also the type of error. So this is more of an analysis tool. You could say, hmm, okay, pretending I'm a, an executive director or an HCV director at a, at a housing authority, say, okay, we have X amount of errors. Where are, what's happening there? Where are the most common denominators? Where can I emphasize some training or maybe some procedure reviews to help with this? Um, this dashboard does that. So on the left-hand side, we'll see the different 5.8s and the number of unique errors by 5.8. Um, so obviously, you know, for this example, it looks like we have a lot of annual re-exam errors and some inspection errors. Chances are those will try to be submitted too late, right? But either way, and then over here on the right, which is like the meat of the dashboard, it'll actually break it down by the type of error. So if we sort it by the error descriptions, oopsies, I meant the number of unique errors. Let's try that one again. We see the most common um, error they're receiving is the new tenant no household exists and new admission. So that means probably the one or the four or maybe uh, was, was probably missing from PIP. 
So again, this is a cool area for PHAs and their local field offices to try to help uh, figure out where some training might be needed. Okay. So the overdue re-exams. So these next set of dashboards are all about overdue re-exams. So why are these here? What does that have to do with pick errors? Well, that's why we tried to create this. Um, we, you know, Overdue re-exams can also be very difficult to manage. So what we've done with this dashboard is we've actually replicated the monthly summarization report from PIC. So when PIC updates every month and you get that, you can go in and run your late re-exam report. It is just a mirror copy here. There's no additional business logic. There's no additional rules in here. We literally take that report from PIC and we throw it in this dashboard. The only thing we do a little differently is this last column, uh, which actually I'll just get to it right now, why not? This column, will let us know, okay, these are all of the late re-exams for this PHA, but why? So these top five, they actually had five eights that were attempted to be submitted to pick, but they fatal out. So that means this PHA did all of the hard work. They had their appointment, they reviewed the docs, they made the five eight, blah, blah, blah. But when they went to submit it, it got rejected. So these five old late re-exams, theoretically could be resolved by correcting uh, and resubmitting the five eight. The ones below that, whereas no penny rejections, that means no 5.8 has been attempted to be sent to pick. So therefore it's a true or um, um, late re-exam. So from here, we did try to include the bare minimum information that we could to help identify these participants. Um, this one can always be a little bit trickier, especially for larger PHAs. If they're smaller, usually the, maybe the initials and the effective date will help with that. Um, however, this report, and actually all of these reports can be exported into Excel, but unfortunately due to licensing issues, only HUD users can do it. So if you reach out to your local field office or your local PIC coach, they'll be able to export this into Excel. And then, um, the PIC or dashboard team, we can help, uh, narrow these down and actually send encrypted, you know, and follow our procedures for PII. We can help identify who these folks actually are if you need additional information. Oh, one more thing to note, I guess, here, um, we do sort the column the exact same way as the pick error report does. So it's usually by default when you go on this page. Um, it starts with the oldest, and then it goes with the most current. One thing to note, especially for any of our MTW friends that might be out there, um, the same way with pick, it uses the annual business logic. So if you're on biennials or even triennials, um, this um, will reflect that. I think Cassie's still got a stomach ache. So could you take her over to school after she gets off work? Would you be able to pick her up at 10 and take her to? Awesome. Thank you, Andrea. Okay. Uh, whoop. Someone had my... oh, that's just awkward. No one's seen me twice. Uh, here we go. Okay. Um, yes. So that is the reason report. Oh, yes, yeah, so back to the MTW friends. So biennials and triennials, you will see false positives in this report the exact same way that you would see them in PIC with the late re-exam report. So friendly heads up there. Moving right along, another monitoring report. So again, internal only, if you want to see how you're doing in comparison to PHs around you, you're more than welcome to. Um, the monitoring reports obviously don't have specific filters. Uh, as you probably noticed with the over -exam re the overdue re-exams, in the fatal errors, your filters actually stay true, uh, which is nice. They kind of stick, so you don't have to keep redoing this every single time. But their mon monitoring report does the same thing as the errors. Big picture, how's everyone doing? And then the last one for this set of dashboard is specifically the late re-exams that have an actual uh, five eight that was rejected. So it's basically just a breakout of the previous report in case you just wanted to focus just on this. So from there, you also might be wondering why we have two dashboards. Uh, Backend reason, easier to update uh, resource constraint. So now we'll focus on the second one. So the second dashboard, it compares PIC data to what was submitted with VMS. At the top, you'll see the much longer explanation of how this dashboard actually works, when it's updated, et cetera. Um, we do wait for the VMS data to be reconciled and official, hence how this is a delay. Um, actually, and ironically, I do have the March data. So as of this afternoon, this will be using March VMS data. Um, so it'll be a little more updated than this, which will be nice. But here we do really do focus on the SPVs because as everyone knows, certain SPVs are 
funded separately somewhere in the Tibber account, right? Sometimes if you look at a big discrepancy, but you don't know where to start. Um, so here we try to make it a little easy by adding the built-in uh, SPV filters. So let's actually, let's go to another state I lived in. Let's go back to uh, good old New York. Actually, probably didn't want to do that. Let's clear our filters and let's hop back just to, to shrink the sample size. Okay, so we're using PIC 5A data with effective dates the exact same as the VMS emission date, right? So this dashboard does update. So as 5As come in, numbers will change. However, the VMS emissions are basically static, right? It's a snapshot in time. Um, so what we've done here is we've taken, like, especially for this first one, we're using UML data. So we are calculating the UML data from PIC. We're comparing it to what was submitted in VMS. And then we calculate the variance. Now, variance is... How come a lot of these aren't zeros, right? Why isn't it a perfect match? Could be a lot of legit reasons. Remember, this is using 5.8 data. So holds, abatements, active HCV participants who are moving that might not be in the unit yet, right? Any of those type of scenarios that affect UMLs or HAPs uh, will not be reflected here. So that's why having a 0%, frankly, is almost impossible. Um, but it's always nice to strive for it, right? Got the fancy color codes, different thresholds. 10 to 30% is yellow. Anything below that is green. Uh, and the filters are broken down by the specific SPV. So this way, if you notice, oh, I have a 10% difference of variance that we hear what's going on, you can look at the generic HCV vouchers for your temper counts, and then you can drill down into the individual SPVs. Um, I always call PIC and VMS kind of the big two, especially when we're talking about reporting requirements back to HUD. So it's a 5.8 for the family level data and obviously VMS for your financials. So it's super important to make sure this is right. Um, maybe some... SPVs are not being labeled correctly. You know, one of the more common ones we see are FYI or FUT. Sometimes these get mixed up a lot. So you could use this dashboard to say, oh, well, hey, my PHA has 10 FYI, but why is PIC saying zero? Well, let's take a look at either the 2N or the 2P field of MTW, right? Maybe you need to look back at that reporting notice, the specific PIH notice for that SPV to go over the reporting requirements. Another example, or another common one that we run into is the mainstream, mainstream only PHAs. Uh, just because a PHA only services or administers in mainstream vouchers, they still have to label them as such. They can't just leave the 2N field blank. Uh, you know, we wouldn't know the difference, right? So making sure those fields are appropriately filled in and accurately uh, is the only way us here at HUD will ever know that. Uh, the next dashboard is a hat calc. So we've done our best. Um, EVMS is going to be a more foolproof way of doing this, but we wanted to get a number out there using 5 eight calculations, um, using PIC data. So we've done that, and then we compare it to also what's submitted with EMS. And very similar to the disclaimer I said earlier, right? The variances could 100% be explained um, by legit causes. So again, striving for perfection is um, <laughs> really hard to do. But the big ones are the ones you focus on, right? If it's a bigger issue, you take out the variances, you know something must be wrong. So um, this can always tie back to maybe it's five base that got rejected, five base that need to be submitted, et cetera. Um, so those are the two dashboards. And I definitely want to pause here and stop here for questions and conversations. I feel like that's always like the best um, source of information for these separate panels. So uh, Andrea, I'll pass it back to you. Great, and I will actually pass it over to Adrian. We do have a few questions in the chat. Yep, absolutely, thank you. So first question for you, Jeff, how can we determine the full name of the participant found to have a PIC error? Our dashboard only provides initials of the participant. Unmute yourself, Jeff. Thank you. New is going to happen eventually, right? <laughs> so uh, real quick, the first set of dashboards, um, you would need to use the ticket number and the form number and log into PIC to figure out who the participant is. Um, from there, but if they're mentioning initials, I'm assuming they're talking about the re-exam. So you have two options here. Um, since this report mirrors the PIC report, you can just log into PIC, pull your late re-exam report, and you'll be given all of the identifying information. 
The other option is um, you can email your local pit coach or field office. They'll know who to get in touch with, and then we can have it translated. But the quickest way and the most efficient way would absolutely be to log into PIC and utilize that monthly report. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next question. If we correct the errors directly in PIC, do we also have to fill out the Excel document in the PIC error dashboard to remove the error from the dashboard? Is that required? Great question. Most cases, no. In most cases, the correct 5A being accepted into PIC will drop them off. Um, however, social security number errors, overlapping sub, um, dates like port outs or EOPs, um, are the probably the most common ones, those would re require a manual removal. Um, so for those, if you go to the dashboard website, right under the dashboard, it would be this section you would use. If it's one, two, three, a small handful, feel free to use the form. 10 or more, um, please use the Excel template, email to your local pick coach and we'll get them all removed for you. All right, next question. Will the expense differences between VMS and PIC be available for MTW agencies? Ah, oh, that's a great question. So MTW reporting is always a little tricky. Um, for these dashboards, it is not. Um, so that's why the filter here is actually just no. Um, so unfortunately, no, MTWs, uh, not so much for the VMS to PIC. Mainly because, just to give a little more explanation why, especially like the original 39, that uh, MTW form, it doesn't have the specific cap fields to allow us to do that. Um, MTWs obviously have a lot of flexibility. So we really lean on VMS because of the uh, family HAP expense and then also the non-HAP uh, expense. Great. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, last question so far. Is there a data dictionary and business rules available for HIP. So while PIC is down, we can refine our in-house daily data validation reports as necessary to ensure our data are ready for transition to HIP. So that's actually not for you. We'll hold that one for Wendelin. Sounds good. Love the question though. <laughs> All right, me too. <laughs> uh, Marika and Denise, did you want any uh, add anything to the conversation? Um, I'm good, unless anybody has a question for me. I'm good. Yeah, I think Jeff covered it, but I think uh, there's a lot of examples out there just to note where you can see that there was specific um, erroneous submissions for uh, especially SPVs. And he had mentioned that FUP and FYI often get um, interchanged. Um, so that's something that we do want to be aware of because it does lead us to have erroneous data for our other dashboards that are based on VMS or on our PIC data for leasing. So Jeff, can you show um, HI 901? Um, I'm here in Hawaii, so it's a little dark here. Sorry for my the light on my computer. But um, if you look at uh, Hawaii Public Housing Authority, um, for specifically the FUP field, it's off by four there. So it's the, they have placed their um, specific pick items with the 2N field as a FUP. Um, so F foster, uh, sorry, family unification program, but it's not in VMS accordingly. So there's a question there of, do they actually have a FUP program at all? Um, and that, especially for our individual dashboards for leasing for the PIC data or the VMS data would actually show that we actually don't know exactly how many um, the Hawaii Public Housing Authority has for this program. If you go to FYI, you'll see the exact inverse. So they have FYI um, for exactly that same four, they have FYI in VMS but they don't have it in PIC. So it's really a question here of which of these programs do they have? And that shows that perfect inverse where if you don't input the 2N field correctly for the type of program, for us pri providing data on the dashboards and the utilization of these vouchers, it could actually throw that off. If they don't have an actual FUP program, but we're showing FUP leasing, 
or they have an FYI program, but they're not showing FYI leasing in PIC, we would be showing the wrong utilization rate. So that's just something that I'd like to highlight there. But otherwise, I think Jeff had it covered. So thanks, Jeff. Can I add one thing about that? Mm -hmm. um, in Absolutely. VMS, at, as a housing authority, if they if you are submitting and you are submitting FUP, but you're getting a hard edit saying, you know, you're entering FUP, but you don't have the program, they need to ensure that their that their FA isn't just approving the hard edit and moving on. Because I can change that. So if they some FUP turn to FYI. And while I run a data mart report every month and try to get the uploads correct, some get missed. So instead of just allowing your FA to approve the hard edit, if you know, in fact, that when you are submitting and you're getting a hard edit and it's an error, you need to contact either me or your FA. It should be your FA. But if they aren't doing that work or responding in the way they should, then please contact me and we can get that changed. And then it all flows together. So it will be, they would match then. Does that make sense? Those two are the hardest ones. I believe FUP and yes. FYI and also mainstream because a lot of the mainstream housing authorities are report, if they have both, report everything in HCV instead of. Absolutely. So all of those things are fixable. So you won't have, you know, problems later. Does that help? Definitely. Thank you, Denise. I really appreciate it. Sure. Yeah, and otherwise I think we're good from our standpoint and we'll let the conversation uh, turn for the next topic. So Thank actually, you so um, we have one more question for you that just came into the chat. So it says for MTW, PIC era dashboard program type only has two categories, MTWNA and vouchers. Are public housing errors included? How do we identify them versus vouchers? I think you talked about that a little bit when you pointed out the MTW. Jeff? Yeah, so the, the MTW data is very tricky. Um, Rika, please jump in if I haven't wrong, but I do not believe the MTWs are included. Actually, that's not true at all. MTW are included here uh, in the overdue re-exams, but again, it's the same logic as PIC, right? So annuals, you'll see a lot of false positives. However, if we hop back to the errors, they are included here as well. So it's mainly the VMS data, the two VMS reports uh, MTW are excluded from, but the rest are here. Uh, but regarding the program type, the... It's hard to explain, but the way it was explained to me from the data team is the back end of PIC when it comes to MTW data tables for us are a little, they're set up a little differently than the others. Um, Marika, I don't know if you have any more specifics you want to add about this third category, but. Um, yeah. especially, so especially for the initial 39, their data was always placed into separate data tables, like so an entirely different schema in our data warehouse. And since those um, specific PHAs had, uh, even a different form. So they had the MTW58 form. Not everything completely jives the same. So they were put, all of that data was placed into a separate table. And that's why we've mostly, especially for those 39, they have defaulted to this MTWNA. If your MTW agency is a newer expansion agency, I don't believe that we've had that same issue because you're going to have older data that might be voucher related that was uh, also. Um, they are a newer MTW, but now um, their previous errors or their previous re-exams before they were actually made into a new MTW expansion agency were on the previous 5.8. And so there could be a combination of the two. Okay, great. Thank you both. Um, those are all the questions for you guys. So definitely want to say thank you for the presentation, for going over those pick errors and all of that great information. And I will now turn it over to Wendelin to do her portion of the panel. I will mention here as we're getting started that um, as part of the overview that 
one of the nice things about HIP is we've spent a long a lot of time with 5058 data to try to map the uh, three different 5058 forms together, two of which, the HUD 5058 and HUD 5058 MTW, are in IMS PIC, the HUD 5058 MTW expansion, which is a lot like the HUD 5058 form, as Marika uh, kind of alluded to. Uh, that will be in the HIP system brand new. And so we we have spent that time to really try to work hard uh, to do that mapping. So hopefully it will be easier for um, systems like VMS, EVMS, and you know, dashboards and whatnot to be able to get that information for all PHAs a little bit better. So kind of a little bonus fact for everybody there. So um, so jumping in here, um, and again, uh, happy to be with everybody here this morning, and, and hopefully you're having a, a great day, and it's not impending rain like it is here in D.C. So. so one of the big differences between IMS PIC and uh, HIP is we use a different file format for the submissions. Now, that's true in IMS PIC as well, to some extent, because the HUD 5058 uses the old ASCII file format, which is like a text file, and MTW uses generally the comma-separated value or CSV file, or sometimes uh, PHAs will also rarely use an Excel file. And so with HIP, we're using the JSON files, which is a more universally accepted format. Every now and then, you know, if you're you click onto a you know more technical page on on a website out on the web for you know a system or a company that does technology stuff, you may even see a reference to JSON files. And so, if you look at them, you can definitely parse out what's in the file a little easier. And it doesn't mean you can build one in five minutes from scratch. You're still going to need your vendor software. And they've been working hard on making the ad adaptations uh, in their systems for this new file format. And also we've been working on making the user or the validation errors more user friendly. Uh, so that they can be easier understood by the end users. Um, and some of those even include ones that relate to SPVs because in the past, some of those, you know, had a whole bunch of codes and everything in the uh, error description. So hopefully those will be a little easier to understand in the new system as well. So PHAs will still stay in their third party software uh, to submit their 5058 forms. And, and just as a, Point of clarification, when I say 5058 forms, I'm talking about all three that I just named a minute ago, uh, but it's just easier to say 5058 forms. So unless I delineate, um, like I will a few times, uh, I'm generally talking about all three. And so you'll be in your vendor software to submit your 5058 forms and to receive the validation results, which is really important because that one of the big asks over the years is to keep PHAs in their vendor software that they're paying for instead of having to log into IMS PIC and browse for a file, wait for it to process after you upload it, go look at the error report and all of that, which is kind of why we got the PIC error dashboard is because PHA has found that process to be a bit tedious. Not to put the error dashboard out of business, but hopefully it'll be a little more user-friendly and time-saving for folks to um, be able to get the validations uh, back through their vendor software. Now, smaller PHAs that currently use the HUD FRS software, those PHAs will still have an option it's a really cool thing I'm really excited about, and that is we're calling it right now because it's very descriptive and don't always need a cute acronym. Um, it's called the Fillable 5058. And so what it is is a web-based form. And so you'll be able to go into the system and actually pull up a existing household or start a new household and fill in a web-based form. 
And so you won't have to install anything on your computer. No more concerns about PII. No more concerns about, I got a new computer. My computer crashed. Windows has come a long way since FRS was last updated. All of that stuff will disappear. And so it will be a great revolution for those smaller PHAs that don't have vendor software. And those are going to be the PHAs that use it are the ones that do not have vendor software. Um, we will not make it available to those PHAs that have vendor software just because they already have the ability uh, to submit 5058 forms with that. So talking about data, uh, for, for a minute, the data from the 50058 forms, all three of them, will be stored in the same area of the system. So as Marika mentioned, and then as I elaborated on, in IMS PIC, because the HUD 50058 MTW came several years after IMS PIC was born, it's stored in a completely different set of database tables, has a, you know, a largely different structure and all sorts of stuff that just doesn't make you know sense to you know the average person. And so the good thing is we're storing everything like I you know mentioned before in the same place and so that that mapping will help with you know more so you know for HUD staff building dashboards uh, for the software vendors building the capability to transmit that data uh, and, and whatnot. So the big difference is we will have a submission type. And so, you know, there's no more the form 50058 module and the MTW module, it'll be one home. And on the forms themselves, and this will be more so for the MTW expansion and MTW, the initial 39 MTW agencies, um, there'll be the submission type that will differentiate whether it's a 5058, an MTW expansion, or an MTW. Those agencies may use the regular 58 if they are not applying MTW flexibilities to a household. So that's why they may get a little more used to looking at that particular item from uh, the submissions than uh, non-MTW PHAs. So some changes uh, that we have made are to corrections and voids. Uh, good changes, don't be scared. And so we'll go over those here uh, in the next few minutes. Another great thing is unlike IMS PIC, issuance of voucher and expiration of voucher can be voided because again, they're stored in the same area of the system that the rest of the 5058 data is. Uh, right now, issuance and expiration of vouchers are stored in a separate table from annuals and interims and new admissions and all of that. And then to differentiate the different versions of the OMB approved form, this is gonna get to be bigger as we start uh, implementing HOTMA flexibilities uh, to uh, reporting. We are using something called the form version date. So right now, what you you know and hopefully don't hate in IMS PIC is the 2020 version of the form because the last time before we started working on things that it was last approved by OMB was in 2020. For some of the forms, that was a renewal, but like for the MTW expansion form, that was the first approval. And so we call that the 2020 version. And then you have the most recent approval here last fall, and they took effect here on January 1st, 2024. Uh, we're referring to that as the 2024 version of the form. And so you'll sometimes hear us talk about that. And so that's what that means. And, you know, like I said, the 2024 version will be brand new in HIP uh, and mainly is the, the HOPMA compliant version of the form. Next slide. So you can correct 5058 forms as long as it meets certain characteristics. So it has to be a 5058 that was migrated to HIP from IMS PIC. The form being corrected does not include a change of public housing unit. And the form being corrected does not initiate a head of household change or other household member change. And, and that's because 
the characteristics of forms carry forward through time. And so if you have a head of household, excuse me, head of household change, and you go and correct a form two or three forms ago, which will be possible in HIP, you will be able to correct forms in the past as long as it doesn't um, include one of those it has to be a form that we migrate but it those those other two characteristics because if you change units change head of household change household members everything after that now is somewhat orphaned and can't really be associated very well with um what you're correcting and so other than that you can correct forms in the past you can correct the most recent form if you're thinking of effective date um, if, you know if if a form prior to the most recent form needs to be corrected any changes that should carry forward to forms with effective dates after it uh, those forms will also need to be corrected. So that's one important thing to remember. There's kind of a trade-off there. You can do it now, but you will have to correct the forms after it just so that you can still have that accurate data. And then the forms mentioned above that cannot be corrected, like you know the, the change of unit, change of head of household or household members, you'll need to void the forms until you get back to that form do the correction to that form and then resubmit uh, those other forms um, with you know that you know updated data as well. Important thing that we run into in IMS PIC, sometimes PHAs use the correction indicator in section two incorrectly. Just because you're correcting fatal errors does not mean you mark 5058 as a correction. And so when we're talking about correction here, we're talking about correcting a form that actually was accepted without fatal errors. Next slide. <laughs> so you might be asking yourself, how does the system know which form is being corrected? And so we have something that HIP assigns two forms when they're submitted called a form name. It basically is the word form and then a hyphen and then a, a number. And so there's a field in the submission file that will contain that form name. And that is what will tell the system, okay, this is the specific form that's being corrected. Right now, sometimes when corrections are done, it's it's like putting together a, a jigsaw puzzle, especially if that correction indicator gets used incorrectly. And this will also help with that because um, that form name will have to mention, will have to tie back to a form name in the system. And form names will be assigned to those forms that are migrated into HIP. So the original form, the one that is being connected, uh, you know, using that form name, uh, will have a status of corrected, and the form that contains the corrected data will have a status of submitted. So that also will help us know what forms have been uh, corrected. Next slide. So now on the you know other side of things, and I mentioned it here a second ago, voiding forms, and so. When you, you know, void a form, again, you'll use this form name that we uh, have instituted in the system. And this is a big improvement because right now in IMS PIC, it's definitely a jigsaw puzzle to sometimes figure out which one was voided. Uh, and sometimes, you know, you end up having to, you know, void a few. And so when even if you have to void more than one, you'll still use that form name and therefore we'll know exactly which form was voided. And so uh, the the original will have a status avoided, and um, and then you know from there you'll be able to submit if you need to submit that form with correct data you'll be able to uh, you know and submit it as a brand new submission. Next slide. So we've kind of talked about what it'll be like in HIP. I uh, just wanted to give you a preview of that so you, you have a taste of what's coming. Now we have a little bit of work, you know, to get ready to come over to HIP. And so speaking about the migration of 5058 data, HUD will migrate all 
current mean the forms in the current database, HUD 5058 and HUD 5058 MTW records, and a limited set of records from the historical database. Um, they, you know, we're, we're still working on the, the time frame because we're still finalizing the data migration. Right now, we're looking at uh, about three years worth of data and, you know, what that exact date range will be. We'll publicize that as we finalize the uh, data migration and get closer to the shutdown of IMS PIC. We will, you know, let everybody know what that date range is going to be of what forms will migrate. But the important thing is going to be if your data is up to date, you know, you'll have at least a couple of forms that we migrate because for the most part, except for like the MTW agencies, it might be doing annuals, not annually. Um, you should have you know, annual re-exams every year. You may also have interims and and whatnot, uh, change of unit. And so, um, you know, that will be the important thing as far as looking at your data. HUD will not migrate submissions that receive fatal errors. And the reason for that is those forms not, are not even considered part of the official record for that household because there's something about that form that didn't pass the validation checks. And so think of it as we use the forms stored in the database as part of the official system of record to report to Congress for funding and other things. And so um, that's why we don't record in the database forms that have fatal errors. And that's why those won't be migrated. And then we also are not going to migrate the error reports. For one thing, they're a different format. Uh, in some cases, there may be errors that were IMS, IMS PIC specific that don't exist in HIP. There's just not that one-to-one -one correlation. And, um, you know, it's going to be a situation where, you know, we'll get data as clean as we can get it in IMS PIC, and then we'll move to HIP. Next slide. So in reviewing your tenant data, you should ensure that the active households, meaning households currently being participated, are listed in your internal records and in IMS PIC. And we'll get into some resources for how you can figure that out here in a minute. But one good starting place is like if you pull an ad hoc report, is the most recent action showing up and uh, the effective date for that action? And then other data, you know, you can look at other data elements uh, for that household to, in order to see uh, if it is the most recent set of information. And then you also want to ensure that any fatal errors on the error reports or on the pick error dashboard um, have been resolved. And so, you know, that will be important because, as, as we said, we're not going to migrate forms that have fatal errors. Now, warning errors, let me just say warning errors are different in that if you only receive a warning error, it's like a yellow stoplight, slow down, take a look at it. Okay, I made note of that. Okay, now I'm going to continue on. But if you receive even one fatal error, that that's where we don't actually accept the form into the system. Next slide. So some of the resources I want to talk about, I, I mentioned the ad hoc report. There's some instructions for how to run that uh, on the IMS PIC job aids page. I will out myself as being the person Jeff was talking about that has authored uh, a lot of those uh, job aids over the years through my work with IMS PIC. So, um, I will also say because of that and my work with HIP now, um, we are going through and trying to make some improvements to those. So like there may be some improvements that get made to like the ad hoc report instructions uh, as we go forward here. Um, there are also the error reports that you can look at, the pick error dashboard. And then finally, um, we haven't mentioned EIV, uh, although I would, Add to what Jeff said earlier about, you know, VMS and, and IMS PIC being the big two, it, 
really it, you know on this side of the house it is like the big three because you don't have EIV without the 5058 data and IMS pick. And so, you know, what I would say is if you have gotten tenant identity flags in EIV, like, you know, the, the social security number, the last name, date of birth, somebody is deceased, uh, something like that in EIV, definitely get those resolved before leaving IMS pick because, um, you know, there are some differences in how HIP is going to work. We still have the tenant ID management submodule. Uh, you know, we still are going to have, you know, alternate IDs and, and ways to do like the SSN to SSN replacement and whatnot. But it, it, it definitely is going to behoove you to fix those EIV issues in EIV um, so that then also similar to the error dashboard where it refreshes, EIV will also refresh and, and show you, yep, you know, those those issues have, have been resolved um, or at least that they're pending re-verification. And so with that, I will go ahead and uh, close this and just say that, um, you know, on the HIP team, we certainly understand that, you know, this is this is a hard transition, just as it's been when we went from Smurf to, you know, IBS and MTCS. And yes, there really was a system called Smurf, um, you know, and, and even all the way into IMS PIC. It's, it's always hard. Definitely understand that, you know, we, you know, we definitely um, you know, want to do what we can to get the information out there, all of us within HUD, to help you make this transition uh, the easiest we can. And uh, on the HIP team, we're working on some FAQs and, and some other stuff to put out there so that you'll have uh, some other resources available to answer some questions, um, you know, in, in the coming, you know, weeks and months here. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Adrian. Thanks, Wendelin. Great information. And of course, you know, there are questions for you because this is a hot topic. So uh, one of them you heard already, but I'll read it again. Thank you. <laughs> is there a data dictionary and business rules available for HIP? So while PIC is down, we can refine our in-house daily data validation reports as necessary to ensure our data are ready for transition to HIP. So there's a lot of really good resources on our HIP technical information page, which and I'll, I'll make sure to put in the chat. Uh, that particular page is mainly for our software vendors because they use a lot of that information to be able to uh, build the software that you're going to be using to transmit your forms to the HIP system. But there's a couple of resources on that page that um, you'll be able to use as well. Um, one thing I can think of is there's a JSON mapping file that will help you know that mapping of, of the fields that might be of interest. Um, one big thing probably when it comes to validations is there is an Excel file that lists all of the error messages that are in HIP or that we are developing. So there are uh, several that right now say TBD because they're still under development. And then as a companion to that, we do have a, uh, the technical reference guide, which I will say I've worked hard to make easier to understand than the IMS pick one because you almost need a PhD for that one. So um, I'll, I'll make sure to put that page in the chat so folks want to take a look at that. Great, thank you. I know you talked a lot about the five eights, but we do have a couple uh, question related to that. So can you address the transition from the current five eight to the updated five eight? Specifically, please remind us when PHAs will need to be utilizing the 2024 five eight. Is this on the same timeline as HIP implementation? So right now, as it stands, when HIP has its opening date, as we call it in the notice, you will be using the 2020 version of the 5058 form. So the one you've been using in IMS PIC. Um, after that, you, we will start using the 2024 version, aka the HOTMA compliant form, uh, once that 
release with that code is installed in IMS PIC. And that is right now scheduled to be around November, so that it will be available by 1125. But um, definitely we'll be providing more information about that as we go along. But yes, on the on the opening date, it will be the 5.8 that everybody's using now. And then um, a, you know, after that, it, it will be the new version. Great, thank you. So for MTW, pick error dashboard program type. Only, nope, sorry, we did that one. <laughs> Next question, sorry. It's um, okay. Does HIP have a reports module as PIC does to assist PHA? Good question. So unfortunately, right now, the answer is no. Uh, that being because we've been really focused on the 5058 forms and building in unit uh, and inventory removals within building and unit and making sure all of those core functionalities were built out uh, so that we actually have things to show on reports, but also because it is a huge undertaking to basically recode the entire 5058 form times three. It's a different platform. Um, this is the only time you'll hear me use the term Salesforce because we don't uh, typically use that term. We, you know, we typically just call it HIP, but it's, you know, it's a different platform and everything. So, um, the reports is something that is going to be a future release thing. And we're already starting to, to look at that to see what reports do we need to bring over from IMS PIC? Uh, what reports need to be brand new uh, that maybe we haven't been able to put in IMS PIC due to lack of development support and whatnot. So um, that is a, a forthcoming item. All right, next question. This is easy. Is HUD going to have in-person training on HIP? So right now we are working on training and, and planning it. Um, the plan right now is to have some in-person training. I don't have a lot of details yet, but yes, there, there are uh, plans right now to have some in-person training. But the great thing I want to add on to that is that we're planning to record it which is important because not everybody can be available on the same day, but also I can't tell you how many times I, I've seen us hold training within HUD and two days later you have somebody new at start at the housing authority and they just missed it. And so that, that is something I've been beating the drum on is recording it so that it will be available um, after we actually have the session. Awesome. Wendelin. What are three things PHAs can do to make sure they are entering data accurately in PIC and in VMS? I don't know if you want to touch the VMS, but the PIC one, definitely for you. Well, I mean, I, I think generically what I would say is, you know, just being, you know, really careful with monitoring, you know, like right now we're talking about data cleanup, but it builds on the monitoring that folks should be doing on a regular basis anyway. And so, you know, periodically PHAs should be pulling either the 5058 monthly reports, an ad hoc report, you know, any of those type of things that are currently in IMS PIC to make sure that their data is up to date because not only are the computer's not perfect, but we aren't either. And so, you know, things happen, you know, fingers slip off keys when you're putting in social security numbers and all sorts of things. And so the biggest thing is the monitoring. So that would be the one big thing. And then also along with that, um, not only monitoring reports, but when it comes to your error reports, making sure you fix those errors in, in, in a timely manner. I know we all get busy, but we all, me included, forget about things. And so those are the two big things I would say about 5058 reporting in general, but speaking about IMS PIC that can be done to ensure the accurate reporting overall, but it also helps with the, the SPVs. Um, I, I will leave the final um, point of the three, maybe to the VMS folks, but I think probably what I would say, you know, 
doing some of that stuff probably helps them as well. Great. Uh, Marika or Jeff, do you want to address that for VMS? Three things PHAs can do to make sure they're entering data accurately in VMS? Sure. So VMS, um, especially for SPVs, can be a little tricky at times. And um, one of the links I actually had on my slide was the PIH notice website. Like, why would I have that? Um, some of the SPVs have specific reporting notices that will help you with 5.8 reporting as well as VMS. Um, the VMS user manual also gets updated pretty regularly, especially if new fields are added. Like, for example, when the EHV fields were added to VMS, that document was updated and there was a specific um, PIH reporting notice for that. So when it comes to VMS, that's kind of your best bet is keep an eye on the PIH notices, look at your award letters, uh, and then keep in touch with your local field office and your assigned uh, financial analyst at the FMC. Great. Thank you, Jeff. All right, Wendelin, back on the hot seat for you. Does HIP, oh, my screen just jumped. Hold on. Sorry, that was me. Yes. I, oh, I was no doing worries. my to-do. <laughs> gotcha. Does HIP have MTCS viewer? Yes, it's not called that because MTCS is actually the system before IMS PIC, but we kind of brought the acronym along. Hopefully, I am. A, we don't bring IMS pick along because that's kind of long. Um, but it's not called viewer. Um, but there is a tile in HIP that will be available to view previously submitted forms. Great. All right. Did HUD test the migration from PIC to HIP with actual PHA data? That is one of the things we're working on right now. All right. Great. Will this HIP transition affect the EIV reporting as it relates to income validation tool, to the income validation tool? So we're working with, you know, various folks across HUD, you know, both Operating Fund, Capital Fund, EIV, um, PASS, FAS, all these different entities to try to make sure any touch points from IMS PIC are accounted for. And so I can't speak specifically to the IVT, but what I would say is we're, we're working with, um, you know, everybody, you know, loosely we're in within HUD using this uh, long word called interoperability uh, to try to make sure that we're, we're, working on all those touch points. And so definitely the IVT is one thing we're aware of and uh, you know more information will be coming out as we get closer uh, to the uh, transition and onboarding with HIP. Great. And Wendelin, you talked a little bit about this already, but I'll ask it just for the sake of the fact that it's in the chat. Uh, will both 5.8 versions be able to be sent by a PHA once HIP is available? So I'm going to assume that this is probably from maybe one of the initial 39 MTW or, or even one of the MTW expansion PHAs, because they're the only ones that this would apply to where they would have to be using the regular 5A and possibly one of those two MTW forms. And so the answer is yes. Um, you know, that. That's another improvement in, with HIP is how we provide those permissions to be able to do that. And so they will be able to, to submit, um, you know, multiple versions uh, or, you know, the, yeah, I guess, versions for lack of a better term, we use that word a lot, of the 5058 form if, if needed, if, if that's applicable to their PHA. All right. Thank you. One last question. Is there going to be support to help PHAs troubleshoot issues after the transition to HIP? Yes. So um, we are going to utilize the React Technical Assistance Center or React TAC for technical assistance with HIP. Um, hopefully that will be the, the main source. Uh, at, you know, we're also working on uh, some other things that maybe we can put in place, you know, there'll be the trainings, you know, FAQs, you know, other things. Hopefully, my hope, having worked with IMS PIC for 22 years and, and learned a lot from that experience is to try to get as many resources out there as we can 
and then also have the the react tac there and then you know probably you have some folks out in the field uh that also can can uh you know help out you know maybe is in like a sme role or or whatnot those are all things we're looking at and and uh, working on putting together right now great thank you Wendelin. that was very helpful definitely appreciate it uh though Oh, hold on. Now I'm going to tell you. But wait, there's more. Uh, there's more. Uh, do we use the same M codes to obtain access to HIP? Good question. Um, I know everybody loves their secure systems, or some people call it WAS, MID. No. Right now, um, access is outside of secure systems. Uh, some of the same security rules will apply, like, you know, you have to log in every 90 days or your account gets deactivated. Um, you know, that, you know, those, you know, protecting PII, all that kind of stuff that we know and love about secure systems, but you will not use your MID for, um, yep, that will be a, a separate user ID and password. All righty. Oh, let me see. Not jumping. Looks <laughs> like we got all the questions. I'm saying that very slow. <laughs> all righty. Looks like that's all the questions in the chat. So thank you, Wendelin. Oh. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Marika. And thank you, Denise. Uh, you oh, one more new see, question. See, see? <laughs> Why are Two more going this to me? Okay. <laughs> you're still jumping. All right. We're going to stay here. Uh, let's see. Well, huh, so... Um, piggybacking off the M codes question, will HUD automatically provide a new code? Yes, everybody will have to get access brand new in HIP. Uh, we are not, then that's a good question. We are not transferring users between IMS PIC and HIP. One reason for that is I actually know for a fact that there are people that have left housing authorities, left HUD, that are still in IMS PIC, and I hate to say it, but in a couple cases, I've even seen a couple people that I know are deceased, and they're still listed as users. And so um, this is a good time to do some housekeeping and make sure that the folks that actually need access get it. But the other thing I'll mention about that, too, uh, just in case somebody else decides to chime in, is that um, access is done a little bit differently in HIP than it is in IMS PIC. So because of staying in your vendor software more and whatnot, there might be people that in the past needed to get into IMS PIC only to submit 5058s that we may need to give them some level of access to HIP. But we also may not, just depending on how things get set up with your vendor software and that access to um, in, into the HIP system. Okay. On that same theme, Wendelin, how will PHAs issue alternative IDs mm -hmm. for mixed families during the PIC shutdown? So... During during the, the period where neither system is available, you won't be able to do that. That's just the bottom line is there won't be a system to do that. So, you know, what I would say is that that'll be something you have to do once you're able to get into HIP. Uh, you'll be able to generate a new alternate ID once you get into HIP, and then you can put that in your software and finalize the form for submission. So you can go ahead and work on the form in your software. It's just that you wouldn't be able to finalize it with that piece of information until after you're able to uh, generate that in HIP. Great. Thank you. Now, this is a million dollar question. What will be the shutdown time of PIC? As it stands right now, as of the implementation notice, um, it is about eight weeks or, or two months. And I say about because it all depends on the data migration and how long it takes to do that. Um, we're going to be doing training during that period, getting towards the end of that period, getting access set up for, for users because you don't want to do that too, too far in advance because, again, people leave their jobs. Um, so right now, that's the expected, you know, shutdown period. That's why in the notice we we say like, 
you know, late summer, and then we, you know, talk about fall uh, for um, the opening date. So that is what things are right now. As things get more finalized, we'll definitely let folks know. All right, great, thank you. All right, let me see if it's gonna jump again in the chat. Looks like we've gotten through all the questions. Oh, let's see, nope, see, y'all keep making me tap dance. Okay, <laughs> one more. When will be the last date to submit any 5-8s before the pick migration to HIP? So um, what it says in the implementation notice is um, mid-August uh, right now is when that would be. Again, as things get closer, we finalize things that are, you know, are the dependencies for the actual shutdown. We will, you know, publicize that date. Right now, uh, it, it's later this summer looking to be um, in, in the August uh, time frame, but I, I can't give a final date till we get some of these things finalized. Sure. Great. Thank you. I'm going to stretch this out because I see folks. <laughs> they keep thinking, fooling us, Adrian. <laughs> they keep fooling us, Wendelin. So see folks may be coming up with some more questions. So while you do that, how about we launch one of our poll questions? Because we did have a couple poll questions just to do a knowledge check. And while we while we're launching the poll, if you think of some more questions, please put them in the chat and we'll answer it. Uh, answer them while we have our experts here. Um, so uh, can we launch one of our poll or launch our polls, uh, Ashley, please? All right, so this one is related to our um, 5 eights. So what is the primary field on the MTW 50058 to ID, I'm sorry, identify, excuse me, an SPV? And you should be able to type that in and then we'll see our results in a few minutes. So what is the primary field on the MTW 50058 to identify an SPV. And Ashley, when those responses come in, you can just shoot it up there. Uh, so everybody answered, but we didn't get what the primary field is. So, Jeff, what is the primary field? Did I lose Jeff? Oh, Jeff actually had to jump off for another okay. call. No worries. No worries. The the answer is 2P. Two 2B? Two, two 2P. Two P P is in fall. 2P. Two 2P. Two so so non-MTWs are 2N and MTWs are 2P. Great. Thank you, Marika. Appreciate that. Didn't know Jeff left me. So all good. So in that uh, time frame, we've actually had some more questions to come in. So back to you, Wendelin. How will these changes affect CMAP? So oh, I we're talking about the HIP transition. Migration. Yeah. Yeah. So the CMAP submodule will not be in uh, HIP on day one. That is something that's future development that we are uh, currently uh, working with the voucher office to get the requirements for. As some folks uh, know, there are some pending changes for CMAP, uh, like SMARM Rural and whatnot. So uh, we're still looking to, at CMAP to see when exactly we should do the development and, you know, should it be the current version of the certification that's in IMS PIC? Should we do the, you know, with the changes, all of that kind of stuff. So uh, it's not going to be there on day one. Um, as far as reporting goes, you'll continue to submit your 5058s like you normally would with that information. So your HQS dates, your re-exams, all of that stuff. Um, you'll keep doing that as you normally would. And then once CMAP is implemented in HIP, that data will be there. 
All right, great. Another question. Will HUD provide guidance or notice regarding the alt ID issue during the period where we cannot complete the 5A so PHAs may document for auditors? So what I would suggest so we can make sure to get something on that out there in our uh, FAQs is I can put in the chat here our mailbox for um, HIP questions. And uh, I would su suggest sending that question into our HIP mailbox so that we can make sure to incorporate that into our FAQs. Because um, right now, I'm not for sure if we've gotten that in one of our previous uh, training sessions here uh, or not to be able to include it. But it is a good question. So uh, I've, I've put that here in the chat and made the chat jump for Adrian. And so... Uh, <laughs> do send that uh, question in so that we can make sure to include it. Excellent. Thank you, Gwendolyn. Um, going back to the CMAP question, here's a follow-up. Does that mean that CMAP would need to be submitted to pick for fiscal year in 630, 2024, earlier than 8 2024 since the system will be down mid-August? So good question. Um, that's actually something we're currently working with the voucher office on to provide additional information. So um, that will be forthcoming, the, the exact answer for that. All righty. Looks like we've slowed down. It's between, is you and me are between lunch, Wendelin. So <laughs> <laughs> I think I feel comfortable uh, closing us out. But before I do that, if there are questions that come to mind after the session, as always, you can email spbconference at enterprisecommunity.org and we will answer those questions for you if something else comes to mind or you think of something. Um, and um, also want to definitely thank this wonderful panel. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Marika. Thank you, Wendelin. Thank you, Denise appreciate your expertise in coming on board to talk to folks about some very important information as it relates to uh, accurate reporting in our systems. So thank you all.